Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Hi. <laughs> All right. Uh, are any of you guys familiar with time series data? Any, any of you guys worked with it before? No one? All right. So we're all going to be learning a lot today, including myself. So um, does anyone have any thoughts on this question, how we can use the past to infer on the future? How we could look to the past to try to make better decisions, better estimates for the future? Any guesses? AI. AI. <laughs> Put it in a black box. Yeah. Yeah? Well, you, history usually uh, repeats itself, so we might be able to use yeah. that. Yeah, sometimes. Or we see like trends right. that can occur, but in different ways, different forms. All right, so let's get into it. and. Um, we got our friend Squidward here, so that helps. Um, so this lecture is going to be on time series prediction, how we can use the past to try to infer on the future, how we can try to learn more from time series data and break it down into uh, nice working pieces and really extract a lot of meaning out of um, pretty random data that can be quite unpredictable. So this is everything we're going over. We're going over. Uh, sequential data, we're, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, and then how sequential data is similar to time series data. And then we'll start to break um, our time series data down by applying different formulas such as moving averages, seasonal decomposition, and autoregressive models. And then finally we'll be going into some of the machine learning applications for time series data. So uh, who's familiar with sequences? Who's taken? All right, so got a couple of people. Who's n anyone not familiar with sequences? Sequential data? Okay, so I'll briefly go over this. Sequential data is um, basically data with an ordering property to it. So like, um, it's also dis uh, taken at discrete intervals, so we don't um, have something continuous like our you know f of x functions from algebra and calculus. What we're dealing with are discrete data points that. Uh, like specified intervals where each point is dependent on the past value. Um, so I, I think a really good example is of non-sequential versus sequential. Uh, sequential data would be an image would be a non-sequential data whereas a video would be like a sequence of images. Um, is that everyone good with that? And where you might have like um, you know, a frame of a movie might be kind of similar to the previous frame of the movie. So it has some sort of um, property to it that um, is dependent on like the previous value. All right, so time series data is simply sequential data where our time is our x-axis. So uh, sequential data over time. You'll often see this represented as like f of t. So like t would be our x-axis going out. Um, some examples of this would be weather, uh, weather data. So I use this app called Dark Skies, and it could give me weather predictions within like one minute. Whereas like maybe the default app on your phone might give hourly or daily forecasts. So that would be kind of our discrete property. Then over time, you could see, um, you know, what was the data yes or what was the weather yesterday? What's the weather going to be like tomorrow? Uh, that sort of thing. And um, this could be at all sorts of intervals. It could be like a 30 minute interval, five minute interval, one second interval, one millisecond interval, whatever we define and whatever your data set kind of represents. So let's start getting into our first, um, our first tool that we're gonna be using to um, really start to break down and learn more from our time series data. So moving averages are simply a way where we um, try to remove some noise from our time series data. So for instance, uh, stock price might be highly volatile, and what we want to do is take an average of point, uh, so we look at a, sp a subset of our total data set, which is like our window, and you could think of it as like a fixed window size that can slide across our data set. And then we average out all those points, and that average becomes the new point um, at the end of our data set. So um, it, we're really reducing variability 
in our time series data. And um, the larger our window gets, the like the broader it is, then the more or the less less um, reactive our average is going to be. So it's going to be kind of moving slower over time because we're looking at a larger window of time versus if we're looking at a smaller window of time, our uh, average is going to be kind of more reactive, more noisy to our data set as a whole. And we'll look into this a lot in our notebook today. But um, So we take a summation of all of our data points over a fixed period, and then we divide that over n, which is our window size. And then simply what we have is the average of data points over um, a fixed time period. And in this graph up here, we have it's a 30-day moving average. And this formula stands for simple moving average. It's just another uh, d denotation of the same thing. So it's no tricks or gimmicks in it. We're just taking a summation and then average, averaging that over time. Is everyone good with this? Everyone solid? All right. So our next formula is called the exponential moving average. And basically what this is, is we're applying a weight to our moving average formula in kind of a recursive manner, where we're trying to give more weight to more recent values and less weight to previous values further in the past. This allows our data to, our, um, our exponential moving average to consider um, more recent, let's say prices or you know um, data points it, it considers it higher, whereas it still has some memory of the past, but it doesn't give as much weight to that. And it's kind of a recursively defined formula. We have um, this alpha term, which is kind of um, our weight. We're going to be getting into that. So our alpha is um, 2 over n plus 1, where n is the size of our moving average, so like 10, 15, 100. And um, Who's taken like Calc 2 where you learn about geometric sums? All right, yeah, so it kind of, it, it kind of decays nicely where um, it, you see in this graph where it decays and at some point it ends up tallying up to like 100%. Uh, so it'd be like in the same ballpark of our, um, our current price. So, um, and also we can calculate the weight for any value at a given point using this. So it's like a relation. Um, it's kind of like a polynomial coefficients. I, some classes cover that. Um, so here's an example of EMA. We have this pretty se simple sequence. And um, our window size is going to be 3. And um, that means our alpha is going to be or 3 plus 1, which is 1 half. And uh, based off of, let's go back, this formula. So our first value is just going to be the same as our time series data. Right? And then our second value, we're going to apply this level of recursion to it. So we consider the new value. So 2, we take 1 half of that. And then we um, subtract this weight from 1. And we apply that to our previous value. And then we add it all together, and we get our new EMA point, which is 3 over 2. And then we, we're going to go for our third value, which is, so we just do the same thing. 1 half times 9, 9 over 2. This is 1 half uh, times 3 over 2. So 3 fourths, 9 halves plus 3 fourths equals 21 over 4. Correct my math if I'm wrong. Uh, so you can see it kind of is following this uptrend in a decent way, but it's still kind of slow. So it's, that's kind of our moving average part where we're reducing variability in our noise, um, what we're looking at. So let's go, let's see a graph of this. And this is our 20 period, or like our 20 day EMA, and this is some stock data. And really what we're seeing is it's quite reactive to these swings. However, it cuts out and smooths out quite a bit of noise um, that we observe in our time series data. And really what we're doing is we're trying to get a better glimpse at what's going on in our data. We're trying to see, um, like if we're feeding this into a model, 
you might not want to feed it a bunch of too much noise. You might want to feed it more. Oh, you might want to feed it more um, smoothed out values and see if it would make a better prediction. All right. Um, one second. So, consider this question uh, really briefly. Which of these graphs represent real stock market data, and which one is kind of pseudo random? You have a guess? I, I'd say the right is one that's pseudo random. Okay, so we have one for the right, and then this one stock market data. Any other guesses? I think it's the other way, but really they, they both look pretty similar. Yeah, so they look pretty similar to each other, right? Any any last guess? The second one. Okay, yeah, so the graph on the right is Apple stock. Um, couple months ago and then this is this kind of random equation or this random sequence uh, don't worry about like writing this down but I gave it like a linear term um, kind of a sine wave function so up and down and then I added some random noise into it and this is like the nth digit of pi so like three one four five nine um, and that's just to get like some randomness thrown into it or pseudo randomness and um, What's surprising about this is, um, like, if we think about it, the stock market probably has some randomness to it, but it also has, like, a lot more factors going into it, such as, like, how well is the company performing? How are there, um, how many people are shopping there? Like, what's the underlying value of the company, and how is that rising over time? So, in our next, uh, in our next tool, we're going to be learning how to break down data into each of these working pieces to see... Uh, what is like the big picture of what's going on to um, in our data set to equal like our final time series point or our most recent time series point? So this method is called seasonal decomposition, and seasonal decomposition has three main components in it. The first one is trend, the second one is seasonality, and the third one is our remainder or our randomness. And as we see in this line, it, um, it has some sort of trend to it, which is this part. We have our seasonality, which is fluctuations, cyclical um, patterns in it. And then there's always going to be some noise in most of our real world data. So we'll be able to isolate it. It might not be highly useful to us, but um, we'll be able to see it and observe it. So there's two main ways that we can use seasonal decomposition. The first one is additive, and the second one is multiplicative. Uh, for the mo majority of this lecture and the workshop, we're going to be using the additive model. Um, but basically, the same thing applies to the multiplicative. And um, maybe, um, uh, so an example of the additive model is maybe um, a certain number of people buy um, like some toy. And then over Christmas, um, like just an extra number of people buy that toy because they're selling it as or using it as gifts. Um, so there's like a predictable just addition to the baseline of toys that we're using. Whereas maybe if um, there's like shoes going on, like you know, like Yeezys come out or whatever, there's like a bunch of like hype created around it, like it's easy or whatever, right? <laughs> there's gonna be like a huge surge and like a multiplying factor in like the price of Yeezys or whatever. And I know that because my roommate resells Yeezys, so. Um, <laughs> yeah. So our trend is going to be like the moving average that we just looked at. Um, we kind of take a broad moving average, but this is really like dependent on what data set that we're using. So I'll kind of show you what it should like look like, but it's going to be up to you to kind of decide this factor and uh, be a data scientist. So right now, let's say this is our seasonal data with some trend. We say it has our cyclical patterns, it has our upticking patterns, or our uptrend. And we want to try to isolate our seasonality. So what we do is we create a simple moving average that is kind of like establishes a baseline to it. 
So we're trying to cover the area underneath all the seasonality and kind of where all that isolate all the action so we can take a better look at what's really going on in the smaller movements. Um, so typically this is gonna be like a broad moving average. So a stock price, maybe a stock price might be like a 200 day moving average. I don't know if you guys are familiar with stocks. Um, and we're gonna be going into an example where I think we use a 50 month moving average on some data that was taken over a period of like 10 or 20 years. But anyways, we take this trend line and then we're gonna subtract it to make our data uh, stationary. Oh, that didn't play. Anyways, I had an animation that didn't play, but it would look somewhat like this, where we don't have an uptrend, we just have our cycles and our randomness. So um, we, we isolate our seasonality and then we're able to start to analyze our cyclical patterns without any influence of uptrend. Does that make sense? Is everyone uh, on board? Any questions so far? All good? Good. So this is uh, a seasonal graph and it's uh, daily temperatures in Melbourne, Australia. And you can see it doesn't have much trend. It's basically um, sideways with cyclical patterns. So um, just looking at this, how would you try to if you knew the temperatures of like, you know, last year, how could you use that to try to like predict the temperature this month? If you knew what it, the weather was like last year, but during the same month, any any guesses? Yeah. You could take like the last ten months that had that the last ten Octobers or whatever, average those values, and then say the eleventh will probably be something like that average. Yeah, that's that's exactly what we're gonna do. Um, we're gonna try to isolate the season. Um, we're gonna be going over this more in the workbook, more in code, but we're trying to find like a seasonal means. Uh, meaning like each season we'll be able to see at exactly which month, what is like the mean trend in that month? Is it gonna be higher or lower than average, right? So here's another example of seasonal revenue with, or no, um, uh, uh, it's time series data with a trend plus a season added to it. So Amazon, they sell a lot during the holidays. Um, like they, they used to ha have to hire a bunch of extra employees and they probably still do to deliver packages. And um, employees work like a ton of overtime and stuff. So they're gonna have a lot more revenue, a lot more expenses, um, and maybe they'll make a lot more money. So this is like important business for Amazon to be able to anticipate what's going to happen each holiday season and accurately prepare for it, hire employees ahead of time, all that. Um, so basically what they could do is uh, figure out kind of like what is the underlying trend in their revenue and then try to isolate each season over time and determine like how, how much more they're going to need to prepare for each holiday season, right? So um, this is just the same example, but um, just a random example, but we're gonna draw a trend line underneath it and then we're gonna subtract it from um, our real data and we're gonna get like this seasonal, seasonally isolated data, right? And this is like some of the algorithm behind it, but basically we're still left with our remainder term and we'll be able to isolate our remainder term once we identify our season and then we just subtract our uh, seasonal term from this and we'll be left with the remainder, but for now we're kind of stuck with it. Um, so obviously in real life, you know, Amazon might not be able to 100% predict how many employees they need, um, but they'll be able to get closer and that's, uh, you know, that's pretty good. Um, there are ways to like try to analyze error and we're gonna be going into that in the next part. And um, basically we can try to tweak our models and whatnot and tweak our, uh, you know, use our data science skill to try to minimize our error when we're doing a seasonal decomposition.
So one more aspect, um, one more tool in the seasonal decomposition uh, toolbox is this algorithm that uh, doesn't only uh, account for our seasonality, our trend, and our remainder, but it also accounts for holidays. And this is the profit algorithm. It was developed by Facebook, so maybe if they have like, you know, server, um, if they have to anticipate how many servers they need to serve Facebook users, and let's say on um, U.S. holidays, more people are on Facebook because not everywhere, they'll be able to use um, this model to try to predict what what it's going to be like. And here's a here's a simple example. But if you have sales during November, you're probably going to have a huge spike during Black Friday, and that spike's going to be pretty much every year. Um, it's slightly different than our seasonal, um, just our, our pure seasonal data because it's going to be a little, we're going to try to make it a little bit more reactive. And you'll also be able to, um, like let's say um, Easter Sunday is on like a different day of each year. We'll be able to like account for Easter Sunday no matter what day it lands on or like Hanukkah or something like that, you know. So it's a little bit more flexible um, as in another component to our seasonal decomposition. And here's the formula for it. All we do is tack on this holiday term. All right, so our next, yeah, you have a question? Yeah, about seasonal decom the, the, or the profit algorithm. Yeah. Is this also multiple, can this be like multiplied too? Yeah, so we, yeah, I, I should include that, but it can also use a multiplicative model. Um, and with the holiday term added in? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, Exactly. And we, yeah, you have a question? And does the profit algorithm just contain the S term and the H term? And then we just work it into the whole Y2? Uh, just everything? Well, we say that, so that, like this would be our current um, observation. And then we basically, um, our model is based off of mainly these three. So our trend, our season, and our holidays. So, um, well, um, like does the profit algorithm, is it just something that we can just pull from like a library or something? Yeah. And it just accounts for the seasonal decomposition and the holidays. It counts for the trend, the season, and the, and the holidays. Oh. So that, that's um, this T term in here. Oh. So it's the same thing as our traditional seasonal decomposition, but now we are counting for holidays on top of that. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. All right, so um, this is going to get a little mathy, a little weedy, but uh, we're going to get through it together. And these are um, kind of a group of models called autoregressive models. So um, let's say you're driving to work. You know, uh, what day is it? It's Wednesday. So I drove to work this morning at 7 AM. And um, maybe Wednesday, there's like horrible traffic, right? And I need to anticipate how long it's gonna take me to go to work. Does anyone have a good idea um, where I can look in our, in the, you know, let's say I have an unlimited data set of traffic data. Where can I look to try to anticipate what traffic is gonna be like on today's Wednesday morning? Any, any clue? Yeah? Uh, maybe try to look at like some seasonality of like previous Wednesdays. Yeah. Like, yeah, so these autoregressive models, what we're doing is using our past observances in kind of a specific way to try to um, predict like today's observance or tomorrow's uh, observance or you know make a prediction based off of what we've seen before. Um, but not quite like seasonal decomposition. It's gonna be a little bit more specific to more recent data points and we'll get into that a little bit. So, does this look familiar to anyone? Does anyone have any clue what it looks like? Something we've seen before? Something you might have had in your classes? So it's, it's, pretty, much, it's pretty much the same as linear regression. So we have, or it's our y equals mx plus b. That's what it is. Y, uh, this would be our b. This would be like mx. And then this is like an error term. Um, to it. And then um, 
this is like our prediction, so it'd be like, why we can't account for today's error because we don't know it yet. So basically what we're doing is we're looking to yesterday, seeing what our observance was, and then we're applying some sort of weights to it, and we could use linear regression to tune these weights and get a more accurate fit. Is everyone cool on that? Any questions on that? All right, so this is just an AR1. So what that means is we're only looking to yesterday's value. But we can expand this out to like an AR2, AR3, AR whatever. And we're going to be looking at um, a bunch of terms over that given previous period. Yeah? So in the example of the traffic and looking on Wednesdays, if you're going to use Arima for that, you'd be looking at previous like days before that that aren't Wednesday, maybe around the same time, or you only want to look at Wednesdays? Like how yeah, so what, what it would do is it would actually account for, like, let's say when we go to fit our model, let's say um, Wednesday morning is like has a strong correlation with every Wednesday, and we know it's a Wednesday, then it's going to give like our um, seventh bias like a high a higher weight than like the Wednesday than bias. like Saturday or something like that, right? Is everyone cool on that? Um, I kind of kept it simple here because um, like it would just fill up the whole slide, but basically we can for every um, like this parameter we can tweak it. So if it's three, we'd have like three of these terms. Everyone good? All right. So um, this is something a little tricky. Um, I'm hoping that I get it across properly, but this is a moving average model. And it's not quite what we saw previously with our simple moving averages. It's more in line with the exponential moving average that we saw. Um, but basically what it is, um, is we're using our previous error. So like, let's say if we made a prediction on, on yesterday, we're using our previous error to adjust for today's prediction. So I, I wanna like break into like a little example. Um, so let's say, I'm just, So, can everyone see me? All right, good, all right. So, all right, so let's say our B is like 10. And so the, the example I wanna get into is gonna be, um, Let's say you have, let's say you're throwing a party, you throw a party every Friday with your friends, right? And you know, someone needs to bring um, cupcakes and Doritos and like red Solo cups, but you don't know how many people are gonna show up. Um, so you're trying to anticipate like what, uh, how, how much you should bring to that party, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have a question? Uh, well, you should probably draw on the whiteboard. Oh, this one? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry. yeah give me a sec. Yeah. You need to stop your flow there. Yeah, no, you're right. I'm going to switch markers. All right, so you're bringing, let's say you're bringing cupcakes to a party. Um, and you like, you know how people are unreliable and stuff. So you never know like how many people are going to show up to your party. You don't know like how much pizza to bring, how many cupcakes to bring. But you can kind of the more parties you have, you can kind of learn what exactly you should bring to that party. Like cut back on all the you know wasted pizza and extra supplies and all that. So um, let's say we're just gonna for our first example. Um, Oh yeah, so really quick, we're just gonna define this as, we're just gonna say this equals, uh, no, actually, it's gonna equal one half. And we're predicting how many cupcakes to bring to our party. So let's say the first time um, we bring 12 cupcakes, 
but only 10 people show up to the party. It's like a weight, so we learn okay. it like in the model. From what it's saying here, yeah, so it's just something we tune. Yes, so something we tune. We're just gonna leave it at one half for now and say it's like static, right. but uh, we're gonna learn how to tune this. But I'll kind of break into the example and see um, kind of the mechanics of it more than okay. how we how we're actually gonna do it. Tune it. So. All right, cool. So we bring 12 cupcakes to the party. Let me see, oh sh shoot, like we brought two extra cupcakes to the party. Um, so our error equals two. So next time, let's say the same number of people show up to the party. What we're gonna do is we're gonna bring one half of that error. So now, um, So we bring 11 cupcakes to the party. So like over time, we're kind of following um, what, like we're kind of learning from our mistakes a little bit um, by applying this kind of residual, um, like a moving average to our air. Um, do you have a question? Yeah. So in this case, is our V0 like the number of people that previously came? Because 10 people came and half of our error one, so that's why we have 11. Yeah, so let's say, yeah. Um, so B0 would be kind of like the Y equals MX plus B thing. So let's say in this case our B is 10. So our baseline is like 10 people show up to the party. But let's say it could be more, it could be less. Mm -hmm. um, so so cool, like our error here is um, 1. And let's say, in, you know, um, the next time 10 people, or no, let's say 11 people show up to the party. So, um, no, actually 12 people show up to the party. So we're back up again. And our predicted, oh, hold on. Sorry, I don't do this often. So now 12 people show up to our party. And our prediction is going to be. Uh, our one half of our error, so 0.5 plus our baseline. So our prediction is going to be like 10.5. And this kind of goes on, but do you kind of see how this resembles a moving average in some way, where um, it's kind of following along um, our previous predictions and learning from the error that we had? And kind of accounting for it in a way where um, we're adjusting each time for our previous error. Okay. Yeah, you have a question. But wait, the bottom line was who actually showed up, or was that the black line? Okay, so our blue is um, who actually showed up. Okay. Okay. So, so in this case, we're we were bringing more cupcakes than we needed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. and like in this example, I guess. Um, what happened is more people showed up at the party. Yeah. We thought it was like kind of converging, and then it ended up where more people showed up. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's actually a really good YouTube video that probably explains this better than I can. But you think it's out. but do you see how like we're if this just stayed constant, eventually it would like converge downwards, and we it would kind of hug the exact number of people that showed up to our party. All right. Cool. Yeah, and um, this phi term is like the factor of our moving average. And then um, this parameter is like how many error points we're looking at. So we can look at um, maybe um, a different span of error. So like that example would be, we're just looking at the previous error, but we could actually look at, let's say three previous error points. So the error over the past three days, and we can consider those. And um, so, we have our autoregressive part where we're looking at um, previous days and seeing what those are doing. And then we have our moving average part, which is where we're accounting for error and learning how to, um, what we're doing is like kind of 
um, learning to get a closer value based off of our previous predictions. And we could combine these together into one model. And um, so we have our same B term, and then we have our AR part, and then our MA part. Does this, does this work for everyone? We're good? All right, so one problem, yeah? What was the A in arm again? Auto, so it's auto regressive, which is gotcha. this. So like the example, if we're trying to figure out what traffic's gonna be like on one day of the week, we might look back to the same day on the previous, or on a previous week, right? I think it's one word, but it's like, it's abbreviated together. All right. So um, kind of where the arm fails is if there is a level of um, like trend in our data. So remember in our seasonal decomposition, we um, subtracted our trend uh, from our overall graph to get our data stationary. And we're gonna add one more component into this uh, to kind of get a similar effect. So um, just like in seasonal decomposition, we subtract that trend and then we're going to be able to analyze the seasonality in it. This does the same thing by using, um, it's called integrated. I, it doesn't apply to like integrals like that we learn in calculus. Really what it is is like a differencing formula that we use to make our data stationary. So um, this overall model, what we're doing is once again we're um, explaining we're trying to make our predictions based off of previously seen values. And um, yeah, so our ARMA model fails if there's a uh, trend in our data. So let's take a look at our integrated part. So if our integrated part is just zero, so it's controlled by this D parameter, it's like the degree of differencing. And if it's zero, we don't touch our data. So um, this, let's say this is like our observed data, and then this is like kind of the sequence that we're performing our analysis after. So it's like our transformed data. In our, in our previous ARMA case, this would just be like our real sequence, right? So our, we don't have to apply any transformation to our data. And then in this one, we do have to apply some transformation to our data. Um, if our degree is one, we're simply taking we're subtracting, like, let's say if we have today's price and yesterday's price, we take the difference between those, and then that creates like a new value um, that's just the difference of those two points. And then if our degrees two, um, it just expands out, kind of, um, it reminds me of like recurrence relations that you do in like CS1, CS2. But like, let's say if you have an exploding growth, you might need to subtract over a certain number of days to get your data back to like a stationary level. So once again, um, our model, this ARIMA model has three different parameters. We have P, D, and Q. P operates our AR part, so the number of lag observations that we're considering. D is our degree of differencing, so our I part, um, which is how many values we're subtracting to get our like uh, stationary sequence, and Q represents our moving average part, which is um, how many uh, residual errors are we looking at to try to factor into our next prediction. And this is our overlying, our, our final formula. It's pretty much the same as the AR part, and it's pretty much the same as linear regression, just with more terms. And of course, this can expand out depending on what we specify as our P, our D, and our Q. Do you have a question? Can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Does the D have any relationship between uh, if, if like if it's multiplicative or like additive? Um, or are those like completely related? No, that's a good point. I think so. Like in a multiplicative model for this, instead of subtracting it, we'd probably divide it by mm -hmm. like a previous value. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it might be like. 
Instead of this, it might be uh, our current value divided by like yesterday's value, right? Yeah. Basically, any you could work uh, interchangeably between the uh, additive and the multiplicative. Just wherever you see an addition sign, you put a, a multiplication sign, and then at any time you see a subtraction, you put a division sign. And um, it really depends on what kind of data set you're looking at to um, apply each of these models. And you'll see, like in our workshop, you're just going to be able to specify like additive or multiplicative. Um, and you'll be able to work with e either of those models. Is everyone good on these parameters? Um, do we have like a good understanding of what they control? How that works? All right, cool. All right, so we're gonna be going, we're just giving a brief overview of using machine learning uh, for time series predictions. So we have this meme, and basically we have all these different components that we just worked with, and we really broken down our time series data into like nice digestible chunks of you know math and rationality. We could see our seasonality. We can see um, like our arima can kind of show us if our model is or if our line is relatively high or relatively low, kind of like the tides of the ocean. Same with our you know, seasonality. We have our moving averages, which kind of tell us the underlying value of what we're looking at, like its baseline. And then we create a megazord, or in this case, like Skynet or something. <laughs> yeah. So um, I kind of I foreshadowed this. So with like our ARIMA models, our seasonal decomposition models, it's very similar to like linear regression. And we could just tune these parameters and start to um, basically take a linear regression and then forecast one time period out. And um, you end up getting fairly decent results with that. And we'll be playing around with mostly that in our, um, in our workshop today. But so we have like, you know, back to this meme, we have all this new data that we just created out of our simple time series, single sequence, just the list of numbers. But we have like all the, we applied all this math to our data. So what we can start to do is we can vectorize our data. So instead of just one observance at each period in time, now we could have different metrics and um, more variables in our, each of our, um, time series observations. Is everyone good on that? Um, so like we can take, you know, a few moving averages of our data. We can apply like our REMA prediction and then we could put these all into one vector and then have a, s a series of vectors over time. And this is just like a brief example, but we could have, you know, several different factors that go into uh, each day. So now we have more data. We basically created more data out of just very simple data, right? And then for our machine learning approach, we're going to be basically feeding in each of these vectors into some sort of model. And our objective is to predict one or more values in the next time frame. So we have like all, all these values over a period of time and we're gonna be weighing each of those and you know, applying our linear regression or gradient descent to try to um, make an assumption about what one of those or more of those values might be the following day. So like a common approach for this is like you look at a sliding window of it so you have your overall data set and then you look at a subset of your overall data and then you try to predict you know the next day and if uh, you could kind of use the next day's let's say uh, ob observations as your training labels uh, like does, does that kind of make sense where you'll be able to just slide a window and try to predict the next day at each time 
and then you slide the window across and you're always trying to predict the next day in the future. And then you can go back, adjust your weights and do that over and over again until you have like reasonable predictions. And um, so this, this is just like generic. I'm not gonna dive into too much into like RNNs and stuff like that. Um, we offer previous lectures on that. But each of these would be our vectors. So um, we can apply like our window of vectors, put that into the model, and we'll try to generate some sort of y hat or prediction. And then after that, um, you know, money, Lambos, yachts, and <laughs> all that. So um, hopefully, hopefully, or Skynet. So, you know. <laughs> But you know there are like with time series data, one thing is it's so unpredictable. Like, um, like can anyone actually really predict the future? We could kind of make really good guesses, but we're never going to get quite perfect on it. So, like even some of the best, uh, you know, stock market models, probably on like you know Wall Street, like all that sort of thing, they probably are just a little bit better than guessing. Because it's such a it's such a hard thing to get a truly accurate model in this kind of realm of data. So our previous lecture was on RNNs. I'm just going to give um, a very broad overview. RNNs deal with sequential data, and that's perfect for time series. So I worked in one of the our team projects here, and um, we used an RNN to try to train stock prices. And um, I think this slide touches on like a lot of good points. There are different kinds of time series data, so it's not just weather and you know um, single data points. You could also observe things like sounds or um, you know speech. We have like a cadence to our speech um, that could be like you could observe that as different you know um, frequencies over a period of time. So a lot of this is not limited to just um, you know single data points on. Um, on a timeline. It could be very three-dimensional, um, very complex data. And then we could try to make very complex predictions. For instance, like uh, if you know, you're throwing a ball across the room and you have a video of it, try to like predict where the ball is going to be in the next frame. It's, it can be quite complex. Um, and, and there's a lot of good machine learning techniques, um, like such as RNNs and LSTMs, that are very good at um, analyzing sequential data because they hold some sort of memory to the past and they consider previous values and previous states. Um, so there's two kinds of uh, forecasting pretty much. Um, both of them use this like sliding window approach. Um, so the first one is regression based. So that would be kind of like our ARIMA model, our seasonal decomposition, and then like a simple linear regression. Basically, at each time point, we're going to take a linear regression, and then we'll try to predict the next value. And then we calculate some sort of error between that forecasted value and the actual value we observed. And the same kind of goes for uh, neural networks, RNNs, and that stuff. Except, you know, um, we're dealing with different architecture, but we're you know we're taking in um, those like vectors of our parameters or. Perhaps those could be just you know current or like uh, values over a specified period, and then we'll try to make a prediction about the future, calculate some error, and then um, you know use gradient descent to try to tune our model over time. So these are some challenges with using um, using like models and all this on time series data, especially with like deep learning models. So this is called like, I, I made up this term, it's like a lazy model, and I saw this happening with the project I was working on. But it's so hard to predict um, accurately what like the next day's price is going to be in this case, or like what, I, you know, what the next point is going to be. So what the model learns to do to minimize loss is um, automatically it will just spit out the previous value that it saw, or like the most recent value that it saw. So like, um, it creates like this echo effect here where every value is, 
that it predicts is just like the previous bet. It doesn't consider any of the other parameters that we pass to it. Um, it's just being lazy, right? And um, I think one way to um, kind of avoid this is you can calculate like, you know, your moving averages and like your seasonality and all that. And then you could just remove the actual like sequence of all your like um, observances or like your prices or whatever. And then your model isn't going to be depending on those values to make a prediction. So it never learns how to, you know, it doesn't have access to it. So it's trying to make predictions based off of um, only, you know, your transformed va values and sequences. All right, um, this is just like, you know, some garbage kind of regression. So if you're Data is all over the place, and there's not much going on to it. Um, this isn't actually time series data, but let's say your values are just up and down and sideways and whatever. It's going to be really hard to make an accurate uh, regression to it. Uh, like if there's no seasonality in it, applying like you know a seasonal model is not going to help you, and um, you're just not going to have meaningful predictions. And then an another thing is. Um, I experienced this where we had like diverging loss in our model and um, where basically you start off just like a little basically guessing each time and then over time you just get worse and worse and the model doesn't perform better or maybe it overfits kind of the lazy model is kind of like overfitting um, but for time series and then also if you just feed let's say your LSTM like a bunch of different parameters it's going to be increasingly hard to train that model. Um, it just becomes challenging. So um, in conclusion, we learned about time series data. We learned about some math that we can use to um, analyze time series data. Uh, we briefly went over some machine learning applications for time series data. And um, do we have any questions? All good? All right. Uh, we're going to start to dive into our workbook now. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I'm gonna go over real quick how to open up our notebook go as usual. Um, I'm gonna grab some water. So yeah, I'll quit there. Um, so go ahead, pull out your electronic devices. And we'll get. I'll help. i walk you guys through pulling that up. Um, yeah. So uh, for those. That came in uh, after they're in the meeting. If you can go to the sign in link uh, right at the beginning, so, um, if you can do that real quick, uh, which is only at the beginning. Pull this up. So, if you can go to the sign in link to sign in for us, if you didn't swipe your card in, um, so we can just get you on record. Um, so I'll leave that up there for a sec. Uh, I think everyone got the link to sign in. Good, that came in after. I think you can. So first we'll head over to our website AIECF dot or UCFAI.org um, and we'll head to the core group and this will be our syllabus that has all of our stuff on it. Um, so go here, we're in the spring 2020 edition. So you can see all our past stuff. Go oh, um, right here we have time series analysis. Um, slides are already up if you want to take a look. So the slides were already up. Um, go ahead and click to follow along on Kaggle. Oh, yeah, John was able to, f to get it up. Oh, so cool. I think Good. That's everything should be yeah. working. And then here you are. Uh, you should cl uh, click uh, copy and edit. If you don't have a Kaggle account, you'll need to create that. You can just use your Google account. I need to sign in real quick. So. Everyone with like uh, pandas, numpy, 
in map fault loop. Okay. Kind of. Well, we'll cover we'll cover a lot. We'll be using a lot today. Okay. To get you like my yeah. my goal is at the end of this, you're a lot more comfortable yeah. with especially pandas and map plot lib. Um, there's a lot we're going to be doing with it, and this is more of like a data science boot camp than it is like um, just like a random workshop where um, we do all the code for you. So there's yeah. going to be plenty of opportunities to like code yourself, and yeah. we'll figure out solutions together. All right, so you're right, good cool. to go. Are you good with reading? I mean, it's not too bad, but. Yeah, I'm going to just have my display open yeah. so I can, so you like, can refer have the... to it if I have to. All right, yeah, you can yeah. do the solution there. Yeah, that works. All right, take it away. All right, cool. All right, let me do this. So, uh, everyone good on the notebook? Have it loaded up? Yeah, so Any problems? Before we get started, good. All right, so you guys, if you've shown up by now, you know the drill. So we're just gonna like load in our data path and um, some of our dependencies in a bit. So time series data, we just went over this. Um, we're gonna be looking at sequential data over time in this work workshop. So let's go ahead and import our dependencies. Um, there's a few new ones in here. So like these you probably have seen before. And then like this new one called stats models and um, Facebook profit, FP profit. Um, these are two new libraries kind of that we're just playing around with. They just have objects that we can simply pass our data into and it spits out our models for us. So it makes some of this a lot more convenient. So um, some examples of time series data, we went over them. Um, like weather, ocean tides, commute times, Disney wait times. Does anyone have any examples like they've been thinking of that uh, make sense? Yeah, any, any more examples? Light intensity from stars. Yeah, yeah, we did that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That was a cool. That was a cool workshop. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, what's cool about stock data is like it's super clean. It's publicly accessible on the internet. So, for our easiest example, we're going to be going over something called the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And basically, the Dow, as it's referred to, is um, kind of a collection of a bunch of different uh, U.S. stocks. So, like. Home Depot, Apple, American Express, and they're just kind of added together into this index, and that is like the Dow Jones. And we could observe the Dow's price movements um, over time. It goes like way back into like the 1800s, I believe, but we're just gonna be looking at from about 1980 until recently. So um, the columns data, there's a few of them. so. We have our date, which is like our timestamp. So what day was it on? And the you know the stock market um, is only open on weekdays minus holidays. So like a couple of weeks ago is President's Day, so we didn't have the stock market was closed. Um, Thanksgiving is closed, Christmas stuff like that. So we're not gonna we're gonna see it's not every day of the week, but it's gonna be enough to get like a nice uh, flow over time. And it's gonna be a large data set. So let's go ahead and load that in and take a look at it. So we have date, open, high, low, close, adjusted close, and volume. Open is the opening price, so when the market's open at 9.30, uh, what is the price of it? High is the highest price during that day. Low is the lowest price during that day. Close is the price that um, it's at when the market's closed at four o'clock. And adjusted close, what this is, is has anyone heard of a stock split? You have? Okay, so like Apple had a stock split um, a while ago. But basically like if a stock is quite high, let's say it's like $2,000, it's gonna be hard for like a student like me to go and buy Apple stock because I don't have $2,000 going around. So what they might do is say, okay, so for every stock, now those are 10 stocks and they divide the price by 10 
and that's like a stock split. So uh, the adjusted close accounts for stock splits, and you might actually see that. Like I, I was training a model on Apple stock over Christmas break, and I forgot to account for the stock split, and like it was just a trash model. Like I just wasted a bunch of time training it because you know it has this price movement, and then there's like a cliff. So like it's not going to learn anything from that. Um, it's going to think that you know stock prices might just tank like out of nowhere and then that's actually a good example there was um an incident a few years called the flash crash flash crash and um basically the stock market dropped like like a ton like i don't know like uh five ten percent which is a lot but only over the course of like one hour so it just went down really fast because all these algorithms were just trading it and sell 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 and then it just went right back up and closed like above the normal price so there's a lot of like weird stuff that kind of happens when we start to use models on um, you know stock prices we kind of see what happens when robots take over um, when there's maybe too much rationality and that causes like irrational things to happen um, so yeah this dates back to 1985 cool and that next block of code we're just plotting it out nice and large and um, so um, one thing we'll see is like on the x-axis, I didn't plot out dates just because it's such a large date range. It will literally take your computer forever to plot out the dates because I guess it has to do a bunch of string conversion and stuff like that over like thousands of points. So I had it on my desktop going. It took like 20 minutes or something. So I, d I don't know why it's so uh, in inefficient, but it is. Um, there's a lot of. Yeah, it's matplotlib. So, like, there, if you're doing a lot of time series prediction, like, or time series analysis, like I had to do to get this workshop going, each library works with dates how it wants to. So, like, some use Unix time, some use like UTC, some use like their own objects. So it's it's like a pain to get them working together. And fortunately, like, you guys won't have to do too much of that. Okay, so. Um, in this block of code, basically what we're doing is we're just kind of zooming in and um, we're looking at like just a smaller period and then I plotted out the volume uh, in a bar graph and then we have our dates at the bottom. So I, I, I zoomed in so we didn't have to like plot out a bunch of dates and, um, and also volume is like just how many transactions occur on that stock on a given day. So um, like let's say if there is a lot of high volume and the price went up, that means a lot of people are probably buying that stock. There could also be really high volume, and the price shoots down, and that means a lot of people are selling the stock. All right, so moving averages. We're gonna be doing this kind of a manual way. Um, we're gonna loop through all of our stock data. We're gonna sum up the previous five observances, and then we're gonna divide those by five, and then we're gonna append that value to a new list, that's our moving average list. So it's, it's a simple for loop inside of a for loop. If you've taken like CS1, intro to C, you might have seen this. Um, it's pretty simple. And then also we're gonna drop, um, we're gonna drop the first five rows because if you think about it, if you have a five day moving average, like how are you gonna calculate the five day moving average for uh, like the third data point. You don't have five values to average over. So we just go ahead and we drop those and like we have plenty of data so we're not going to worry about it. All right. And now we're going to plot that out next to our price. And you see our, um, so in blue we have the Dow Jones over a given period and then in the green we have our five day moving average and you see a, a five day is not that long so it's going to be still like quite reactive but it applies like quite a bit of smoothing to our data so um, it doesn't have a ton of noise in it um, but it's still you know some noise if you were to zoom out more you'd see that it's relatively up and down quite a bit we're gonna create some more moving averages. So we're gonna define a list of moving averages, 10, 15, 50, 100, 
200, 500. And feel free to like throw in whatever number you want to see there. Um, doesn't matter. Like you can calculate whatever moving average you want. And then we're just going to loop through each of those averages. And this is like a kind of like a fancy one liner I did. Um, that replaces all this for loop code that is up here. Um, so uh, this is just like what we're naming the column. And then what we're doing is we're taking the adjusted closing price and then this dot rolling um, method in pandas uh, gives us like our sliding window kind of uh, approach. And then we're going to specify that window by our average. And then in that window, we're going to take a mean. Um, so basically, um, a codified way of moving average. Let's take a look at what those values look like. Does anyone see something wrong with our data frame here? Yeah, there's a lot of not a numbers. And you want more numbers than not a numbers. So I mentioned this before, but so we calculated something like a 500 day moving average. So we're going to have not a numbers up until our 500th data point. And also we've dropped our first five frames, so 505. So we're going to go ahead and just drop all those frames. And we're dealing with years of data, so this doesn't matter too much if we throw out um, a couple years. Let's go ahead and um, plot these out. Nice. So you see how, um, like, the smaller our window is, like, the more it follows the real price of the data, where um, our like our 500-day moving average is pretty stubborn to like even pretty reasonable like reasonably large fluctuations in data like this huge drop here it just goes down a little bit and it kind of smooths out a lot um, um yeah you have a question so what moving average would you say is the best out of these like, probably I, like 200 because it kind of follows the bottom a bit more or what do you think yeah so some are more useful than others. Like a five-day moving average might not be that useful because you might as well like it's like so close to the real price, so you're not really extracting more value out of it. But as we saw with our seasonal decomposition, sometimes taking a large moving average gives us like a really good metric to like um, like our baseline right. of what our value is kind of hovering at. Well, I think I was asking like because the five like. Would, would the 200 be better than the 500 since the 200 kind of hugs the bottom of the line a bit more, like you said before, or would the 500 still be good in this case? I'm, I'm curious. Well, it, de it depends on like what purpose you're using them for. Okay. So I give you are feeding them into a model, like you would, it would depend on, you know, what you're uh, trying to predict, what you're trying to predict um, the scope of it, all that. But um, I would say neither are better than the other. It just depends on like your purpose for it. Each of them have like a tool. Um, yeah. Are we are we good up until this point? Everyone following? Cool. So we're gonna go into our exponential moving average, and once again, this is like uh, a recursively defined formula where we have this decaying um, weight to each of our values, and we um, calculate our moving average and we multiply it by this weight depending on how far it's off. So we give more um, priority to more recent values and less priority to values further in the past. So our moving average like considers each of them pretty equally, like the average, so it's pretty democratic in that way, whereas our exponential moving average gets preference to more recent values. Um, this, is, this is like another, um, so this is like one of these pandas kind of one-liners. And basically, um, last time we had window, this is like an exponential window. So it takes that window and then ex uh, applies like an exponential decaying weight to it. And then we take the mean of those values. 
So right now we're, we're gonna, and the span thing controls our window, or the span parameter. So we're taking the five day exponential moving average. And then we're gonna plot it out um, real quick. And it, you see how it does a good job at staying close to the actual price, but it, uh, it isn't too noisy. So it does a good job and it's quite reactive. So, you know, even when, um, let's say there's this drop, it, it reacts pretty fast to it. Yeah. Uh, what's the adjust parameter that you have? The adjust equals false for the EWM option? Um, honestly, I, I don't know. This is the documentation? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't sure. Can you shift out it? Does that work? I d I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, that's just a documentation. Yeah, I don't think it does. But if we get rid of it, it stays the same. So it's probably it's probably something that we don't need uh, okay. immediately. But like he said, I would highly recommend like going through the documentation. I think I even threw in some links here to like if you're lost on something, you could like go to the docs. And most of this I like either pull from the docs or. Um, like really high, uh, relied on them heavily to figure out what was going on. So we're going to plot our exponential moving average next to our simple moving average and see kind of what they look like. So in our um, in our green we have um, we have our price and then in the in the blue we have our EMA and in the orange we have our moving average and um, you see how our blue line it it's better it better fits to our real price um, like here like you see this little dip here and immediately our EMA dips but our moving average like it might even take up, it's, it takes up until like up here, so like a few days delayed reaction to actually adjust for that small dip. Um, so that's kind of the benefit of a exponential moving average. And just in general, like you could probably apply some sort of like mean squared error to figure out like how, how well it's fitting to the real value. And you would find that the exponential moving average fits better to the real value. We're gonna start going into seasonal decomposition. Um, so like like we saw with our example of the two graphs, there's a lot that goes into like uh, the real value of our, uh, our of our time series data. So it could be seasonal factors, trend factors, randomness, holidays, um, you name it. We're gonna be using our additive formula just for simplicity makes life, life easier. And once again, we have our our uh, three factors. We have our season, trend, and remainder. So our next data set that we're looking at is this air travel passenger data set. And it's the volume of air travel air travelers in the 1940s through about the 1960s. So we're going to go ahead and load that in. Let's take a look. Um, so we have our timestamp, which is each month uh, along with the year. We have our passengers, which is an integer value. I think it's in the uh, either the tens of thousands or the hundreds of thousands, but it just gives us an integer value. Um, I couldn't actually find exactly like if it was tens of thousands or whatever, um, but obviously like not just 120 or 12 people flew, maybe in like, you know, 1900, but uh, not in 1949. Flying was already getting popular. So let's plot out this data, see what it looks like. And um, this is a classic example of our, um, we have our trend and we have our season, and then we have some randomness thrown in there. So our first step is going to be to detrend our data. We're going to be taking um, our simple moving average over a 48 month window. So why 48? 
we're taking a 40 uh, month window because 48 is divisible by 12. And in order to do a, a annual seasonal decomposition, we're gonna be looking at 12 month periods. So we want, um, we want something that's gonna be, um, that's gonna fit in line with our, um, with their uh, seasonal data. So like we don't wanna have like half of a data frame on a seasonal chart. So we're plotting out our real data with our seasonal data, or no, not with our seasonal data, with our trend line. We see this trend line kind of makes a really nice baseline on, this, uh, on our data set. At the latter part, we see it's like not quite perfect. Um, maybe like a multiplicative model uh, might make sense in this case, because as you see, like our, our seasonal swings get larger and larger that would be an example of like some multiplication going, um, right? But just for this purpose, we're gonna use a, our additive model still. So let's, we're gonna go ahead and isolate our trend. Basically, we're creating a new column that is our, um, the number of passengers minus our moving average. And then we're gonna go ahead and plot it out. So this is what that looks like. Um, Basically, it kind of just hovers. It goes. It's stationary for the most part, and uh, we see each of our seasonal swings. It's not going up and up too much over time. A little bit, but not not too much. So our next step is going to be to find our seasonality. We're actually going to create a new data frame. This is kind of um, this got kind of weedy with it, but we're going to chop up our data into like. Uh, 12 month periods and then we're going to create like for each year we're going to have like a new column and then we're going to like overlay those all on top of each other and see what it looks like. Is everyone following on that? Good. Um, so once again we're um, looping through 12 month periods and we're going to be like doing some fancy indexing to get um, our, each of our annual um, trends. And we're gonna go ahead and plot that out and um, take a look, take a look. So as you can see, like, it's pretty obvious that it follows like a nice pattern where um, each season is pretty consistent where you have a uptick in one month and it's the same as like the previous year. This is the whole idea behind seasonal decomposition. And actually, so originally I thought, I assumed that the highest, um, the highest air travel is gonna be in December because everyone travels, right? And then I went through this data set and I plotted out the months and all that. And I said, August, like who's, who's traveling in August? And actually, if you look up right now, highest, um, highest air travel month, it's gonna be like late summer, or early fall. Like, um, so. I guess that's when you don't want to fly. And I know that's a pretty busy business season as well, but um, it's actually quite low to fly, or uh, not not so busy um, to fly during the holidays, according to our data. So our next, our next cell, what we're doing is we're just gonna take an average of each of these points and plot that out, um, see what it looks like. All right, I, I kind of um, grayed out our um, previously seen data, but this would be an example of our seasonal mean. So let's say if we wanted to try to guess next year, we can use this seasonal mean to determine how, um, how much more or less uh, air travel we can predict or expect on top of our trend line that we kind of defined. So uh, yeah. Yeah, it's the average of the seasonal component of each of our years. So in order to test out the multiplicative model, um, we are gonna use this stats model library. Um, this creates like, it, it basically streams line, lines it. Um, all that work we just did, it does it in a few lines of code. Um, we're gonna load up our data set 
again because we're gonna be um, we're gonna be we have to deal with like special date objects with this date time module. So um, for each date, we're passing it through a parser function. Um, TLDRs make things work nice, um, but um, that's like this parse date thing, and then we define our parser uh, over here, and that and that's our function. And um, right here, we can um, we're declaring our um, objects from the seasonal decompose uh, function. We pass through our data and we define it as either multiplicative or additive. And then um, John fixed this code, sweet. And then we could simply the, it has built in plotting to it, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, the, the PD plotting thing, basically you had to write, run this in order for the seasonal de de decompose to actually yeah. It's, run with the dates and stuff. Yeah, like Matplotlib really has their own date uh, yeah, so thing for it. That's why, that's what that PD plot Yeah, is. I spent like, probably the majority of making this was figuring out how to use dates in <laughs> Matplotlib. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but yeah, we see like, we, we see our trend, which is pretty similar to like what we saw previously. Um, we see, um, this is our real data. Here's our seasonal, um, our seasonality over each you know each time period each annual period and then this also accounts for residual error um, the reason we didn't actually like try to isolate our residual error is because we had like each of these 12 months frames and then we'd have to like add them all together and it'd just be a headache so we're just gonna let this do it for us um, so uh, we're gonna be heading into the Rima model so um, once again autoregressive integrated moving average Auto regressive. That means we're looking at the relationship between um, current values and previously seen values. Integrated means that we're going to be doing some subtraction. So our air passenger data set sees like a general, almost linear looking trend um, over time. So um, what's cool is like if if we're moving up linearly, right, and you. Um, so like y equals mx plus b. If we know our m is constant, then what we can do is if we subtract two points over time at um, any period along that um, linear movement, then it's gonna become stationary. Um, since we're just moving up, like each value is just, we're just applying a constant to the next value. So it's, if we um, subtract those, it's just going to station out our data. And then our moving average part, that's um, using our error to account for basically adjusting our model um, kind of in a recursive manner. And uh, we define like the number of lag observations and um, moving out average observations, as well as the number of um, our degree of differencing, which is like uh, that thing that kind of looks like a recurrence relation where we're subtracting uh, multiple times from our data if we want to. But we're going to keep it simple. We're going to basically use ARIMA 111. Um, and we can, um, we're going to go ahead and, okay, so the, I didn't cover this in the lecture, but it's called autocorrelation. This is used for our AR component. So, um, we're gonna see how correlated some values are to others over time. So like the example said, if you know traffic's really bad on uh, Monday and Wednesday morning, uh, you'll be able to see that there's gonna be high correlation from let's say a week ago or whatever. So like a seven day high correlation. Um, so we plot this out and basically like you know, one is um, high correlation, and then this is like um, zero would be like close to no correlation, and then negative would be like negative correlation. Um, we briefly covered Matthew's correlation coefficients, kind of the same metric, but this is like over a time period. Um, we also see like we have these swings in our data, so that might be our seasonal period. So like 
one um, one season, uh, one year might relate heavily to like one season the next year, right? So, you know, um, flight uh, flight volume this month might be really similar to flight volume this month but a year ago, and that's probably why we see these upticks. But then over time, um, basically since we have our our upward trend, our correlation is going to become less and less and less. Also, here's a link to the documentation. It's kind of like a, not a super um, giant library like that we deal with previously, like scikit-learn, NumPy, et cetera. It's kind of niche. It's like just statistic models, but there's like a lot we can play around here. And you could also use like the ARMA model uh, or just like an AR model. Um, so this is like some data processing we have to do. Um, to make it work nice, nicely. Um, this is kind of like our test train split, except it's gonna be a little different since we're not dealing with, um, you know, pure, let's say values and labels like our iris data set where we had, um, like in our iris, iris data set, what we had is there are certain metrics that determine um, like a certain label, right? But in here, like, what we're looking at is a previous window and then like the next window. So we actually wanna like just take a chunk of that data set that's continuous and then leave a chunk for training. So it's a little bit different um, how we're gonna separate our sequential data versus our non-sequential data. This history is simply like, so um, if we take a chunk of our data to train on and then we take a chunk for our testing, basically, uh, the further along we're going to be predicting, we want to add those test values back into our training uh, values because we're going to be looking at like um, we're going to be looking at the next one. So we always like let's say in real life you're always going to have the previous day's value because that already happened, right? Um, it's kind of the same concept. Like we don't want to just um, close our eyes to like what's going on. We actually want to use those values after we observe them and add those back into our training data. And then this uh, list is a array basically of our predictions. Okay, so we're gonna loop through our training or er, our test data. And uh, this is like a little bit of a different training loop than what we've seen before. Each time we're going to be declaring a model and fitting it on our history, so our previously seen values. Um, but we don't know what our current testing value is yet. So we've seen all the points up until the one we're trying to predict. Feel free to play around with these. Um, th these are our P, our D, and our Q. So um, you might get different results. We're going to fit our model, and then we're going to create um, a forecast. And out of our forecast, we're just going to take, like, it, re it returns a tuple. Um, so I think it returns, like, a tuple of the actual value and then our predicted value, and we just want the predicted value, and that's going to become our, like, y hat or our prediction. We're going to append that predictions to uh, that y hat to our prediction list. And uh, we're going to, uh, then we're going to add our test value back into our history. So on the next iteration, we'll be able to see it again. So we'll be able to know what our previous day price is. Um, and like, like we covered in the lecture, our ARIMA model is going to be dependent on like some of our previous prices. So that's why that's especially important in this. So if we didn't have that previous day price, uh, we wouldn't be able to like actually apply our ARIMA regression on the most recent prices. Or not prices, but points. All right, so, and then we're gonna plot out, we're gonna loop through all our test data and plot it out. Cool, so 
our test data is in blue and our predictions are in red, I believe. I'm like I'm like super colorblind, so like sometimes I like like I gave a, a workshop on our um, uh, SVMs and stuff, and there was like a purple line, and I call it blue. So like if I'm ever wrong on colors, like I apologize. Cool though. So like um, you can see, it's not just simply like our lazy model. It kind of it kind of looks like it, but it's not. It's actually predicting like kind of too far ahead like the echo is kind of more from um, our test data so maybe there's a way that we can tweak our P D and Q to get it like more precisely so definitely play around with that all right um, next we're gonna be going into the profit model so seasonal decomposition plus holidays I don't think this has any holiday data but um, maybe like Christmas Eve is like a really popular travel day so you might need to account account for that each year but since this is like monthly uh, monthly data there's not going to be many holidays in it but um, I'm just showing you the code so maybe you could apply it to your own situation so there's like this FB profit library you could pip install it and then you could just call this profit object um, what's really annoying is like um, so the library is maintained by Facebook and all that and they make you, they make your columns be specific names. So you can't like, you have to define them by like renaming them. So that's what we're doing here. Our month becomes our date stamp, our DS. Our passengers become our Y. Um, then we're gonna fit that model and we're gonna make, uh, we're gonna make a, f basically what we're doing here is making a, a data frame for the future. So um, we're kind of just allocating space ahead of us uh, that we can use and then uh, we go ahead and we're trying to predict so we we just created like a data frame and then we pass it into our predict function and then our model is gonna make predictions and like populate that data frame for us And um, as you can see here, this is like the entirety of our data. And then it creates this new 12 month period uh, right here. And you see it kind of has, like this is our forecast and it has like some seasonality to it that looks very similar to like what we previously saw. And it also rises up. So it, it contains that trend as well, which is pretty cool. All right, so in case you like live under a rock, um, there's a pathogen in the air or something. I don't know. I try to avoid the news. It's fear mongering, but what's cool is like, um, the more you learn about data science, like the more you could apply it to like real life situations. Like you're not just going to use, you know, MNIST or, um, IRIS data set every day. Like you want to actually like find a real problem that you could go ahead and solve. So in this case, we're going to be trying to look at um, the coronavirus data set, which is on Kaggle. And none of our predictions are probably going to really be accurate, but I think it's a good example of getting you guys to learn how to work with real data sets that just like come out of nowhere. So there's a lot of processing that we have to do here to make this actually work. So let's go ahead and load in our data set and take a look at it. And you guys, you guys have a lot of work um, to do here. So does so take a look at the column named observation date. Does anyone see a problem? The same date. Yeah. Um, so maybe let's do this. Do you have, uh... All right, so now they're, now they're not the same date. Um, well, each of these two chunks are the same date, but basically all of our data is based on location because they're collecting it um, based off of like what state or country um, 
is in and then those countries like probably report it to like um like the who and then the who generates a data set um, based off of each location so that's the form that we got our data but we have to learn how to work with it and apply some time series analysis to it so you guys have a, a task to do you have to sum up all of the confirmed cases on each given date so like all the cases in the world on just one date um, does anyone have an idea of how to how we can do this I, I kind of allude to it but it, it's a little um, CS1 CS2 trick um, that we can use to get this going So, yeah? Um, I mean, maybe we can make like a set of dates and then say if it matches a set or matches a date that's in the set, we can average it with what we currently have, I guess. Or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, this is kind of like what it looks like. So, um, so like, you know, 3 slash 2. Let's say this is like 5, 3 slash 2. And this is like 7. And then we have like three slash five. This is like sixteen. This is like eighteen or whatever. And these are each like this is in California, this is in you know China, this is in Singapore. But we just want to find the total. So what we do is we create a hash set that is like each of our keys for our hash set are gonna be the date. And then we loop through our entire data set. And each time we, we index it by that key, and each time we see a number, we just add that number to that hash set. So, um, has anyone like implemented it yet? Anyone able to figure it out? Only got ten minutes. Thanks. All right, cool. Uh, we'll we'll blaze through it. So, um, I'll just kind of share it, but um. Yeah. So um, the for loop that I already put there, that's just a nice way to iterate through each of the rows in our data frame. Um, and just kind of the form it's in. So we're going to iterate through each of the rows. We're going to grab the current date that row is at. And then we're going to index the the hash set by that date and then we're going to add to it that same row plus the number of confirmed cases ooh trace back here um. you wrote down a of oh yeah cool All right, so we have this hash set. You know, um, hash sets are can only be accessed by dates, but we want to put this back into a time series format. So we're going to create a new data frame, and then we're going to um, we're going to loop through each of our um, keys in order, and then add those keys to, or we're going to index the hash hash uh, set by those keys and then mark that as like the confirmed case at that time. So this is just our dates, our data frame previously. Now we have our dates plus the number of confirmed cases. Um, so let's go ahead and plot it. Um, you could maybe refer to previously seen um, code, but I'm going to type it up up here.
part. So it's those three lines of code. And what we're left with is the graph of the coronavirus. Oh. And our dates are all screwed up. So uh, when you try to plot dates um, over each other, like they'll just kind of overlap. There's some code um, up above that deals with that. Basically, you create a new list and you can specify like how many, um, like what date uh, frequency you're going to look at. So um, we're going to go ahead and calculate the five day moving average. Feel free to look, like you could basically, um, it's going to be the same thing for doing um, our stock price moving average. So it's this dot rolling window equals five dot mean, and then So now we have our five day moving average plotted along our coronavirus data. Um, is everyone able to get that down? Good. And if um, we have we have the solutions posted online, uh, as well as. Um, you could reference the previous code, and I would encourage you to try to take the previous code and modify it so it works on this data set. It's not too hard. You just have to change some of the column names and maybe try to figure out how to get the dates to work. So uh, really briefly, we're going to try to forecast the coronavirus. Um, it doesn't look good, trust me. But um, Sweet. <laughs> really what it is is like we're going to these two models, like the ARIMA and the PROFIT, they're very linear regression based. So it's going to look pretty much like a linear regression. But it is cool like how we can try to forecast it into the future versus just drawing a straight line through it. And yeah, so it's, it's a little bit different, but it's cool. So um, we rename our columns to make it work with Facebook's stupid library. We fit it. Uh, we make a future. Uh, and our future um, prediction is going to be 50 days out. And then the model returns, um, or the forecast returns like a bunch of different things. So like it'll try to figure out the trend, the seasonality, uh, and a bunch of different metrics, like a bunch of stats metrics. So uh, if you want, you can um, print out our forecasts and see what it looks like. But we're just going to be looking at a few of them. So um, our y hat lower and our y hat upper. So th these are just lower and upper bounds that I gave on our in linear regression. And you'll kind of see what it looks like. I think if I've, I forecasted this out like a year, and it said like 10 billion people would be infected, <laughs> <laughs> which doesn't, make, doesn't sound good. But um, how many people there are on the planet. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna like I don't know, become like interplanetary, like yeah. have like a bunch of people like in uh, like Asimov so books, and then and then we're all gonna die from coronavirus. <laughs> 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 all right, so this is like another challenge, and it's um, to try to implement the Arima model. It's uh, it's pretty tricky. Um, like I did it, and it was like honestly, it was like forty lines of code, but um. Definitely, definitely, definitely go back and look at what we saw, the code that we did previously for the airline passengers, and try to use that for um, like the Arima. It looks pretty similar to the Facebook one, but it's just good to like work with these libraries, try to figure out how to make it work on a 
new data set that we just pulled off online. We were able to clean it up and now make predictions on it, which is pretty cool. Like this data set's only like, I think four days old or something like that. So they update it every day. Yeah, it's cool. Um, and then last challenge, um, like I, I think this would be cool. Uh, each in our coronavirus data set, we have each of the locations. So theoretically, you could plot out, you know, at each location, it grows over this period of time. So you might need to do like um, a hash map instead of a hash map, um, where one key is the date, one key is the um, location, and then the next one is the value. That's That would be how I would do it. And then you'd be able to show at each location what the coronavirus trend looks like. And what's actually cool is you can like find the locational data, so like the latitude, longitude, and then you could actually plot that over a map, which would be pretty cool, so. Wait, the location that specific? Well, it's like region, so you maybe like, uh, there's some like Python map things, so if it's like China, you might be able to show China like grows over time, you know, or like United countries. States. What about something like Orlando? <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe not that specific, but um, yeah. It, Just like countries. Yeah, yeah. Like um, real life playing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. You could Somebody's playing Plague Inc. with coronavirus. Yeah. yeah. You could use that to like, like for the country mm -hmm. and then just get the country more red for the for, like the proportion of its population that's infected. Yes, like but green. somebody yeah, somebody exactly. somebody <laughs> took the easy way and started in China. They should have started in Greenland. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> um, so I wanted to say uh, so thank you again, Nick. Thanks. Well, Appreciate great it. Great notebook. Thank you. Um, so the solutions are posted on our GitHub. So if you go to the website, you can view the notebook on GitHub, and that actually has the solution to these cells. So if you need some help, uh, the solution is posted there. So you can take a look at that. Um, before you go, here, let me type that, uh, the sure. feedback link. Um, so please give us feedback for how well uh, we did, Nick did here. Um, so you can go to, uh, to our website, ucfai.org org forward slash feedback so go ahead and go to that link um, and it's just a few quick questions I'm going to take you a few minutes it's about you know how well Nick did and we're for presentation how well the content is and any feedback you want to give to help us improve for uh, next semester so we yeah. really appreciate that uh, thank you for coming out by the way I know it's right before spring break so I uh, appreciate you coming out this week yeah I think so um, yeah, so is there any other final questions or anything for Nick? Last thoughts? Well, I'll pro we'll probably hang out for a few minutes after yeah. as we pack up. Yeah. So. And uh, yeah. feel free to like hit me up if you have questions on yeah. this workbook or yes. other time series analysis. Yeah. Yeah, our Discord. Remember, ucfa.org forward slash Discord. Yeah, do our Discord stuff. So. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay.